need to uh, try and stay with our schedule at least a little bit. Um, so welcome everybody. I'm Steve Mummy, the co-president of the Colorado uh, AAUP. Uh, and I know most of you, but it's nice to meet some new faces. And uh, um, uh, welcome to this, uh, this uh, uh, long planned and, and, and I think uh, much needed uh, symposium on academic freedom. Uh, and, and we have a, a really great uh, lineup of speakers today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to that. I do want to thank the Assembly of State Conferences of the National AAP uh, for uh, lending us some money <laughs> to, uh, to, to uh, uh, <coughs> host this, uh, this meeting. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, a number of people in our state conference, uh, Jonathan Reese, who will be here uh, in a while, he's picking up Alice Dreger, and uh, and then uh, uh, Caprice Lawless, who has worked tirelessly putting this together, uh, and uh, done a, a, just a wonderful job. Uh, Don Iran, uh, who has also worked tirelessly on this uh, this program, and uh, Marky Lecomte, who has pitched in quite a bit as well, and uh, and Cameron Sahami, who's out trying to guide people here, if they're wandering around the Kittredge complex. <laughs> so, but Cameron has, has handled all the, the money and the finances, and I, I really, really appreciate that. <clears throat> well, I'm not going to say, say too much. I just want to have a, <clears throat> make a few comments. <clears throat> and I think there are three points to make uh, about academic uh, freedom. It's a core value of American universities. Uh, and uh, it's mantra in, in faculty manuals all across the country. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, what's fascinating about that is that uh, it's always contested. It's, it's never assured. <laughs> it's, uh, as, as, as much as uh, universities profess to be uh, uh, heavily invested and committed to academic freedom, uh, they all are also sort of in the business of violating it all the time. And that's, a, that's, that's unfortunate. It's just it's one of those things that, that uh, compels us to be continually attentive to the problem of academic uh, freedom, academic freedom. Second point I'll make is that it's it's practiced in such a, a diverse range of venues. Uh, it's a, it's a, we think of it as a as a, a value uh, that applies to uh, pedagogy, to our work in the classrooms as professors, uh, but it certainly uh, extends well beyond that to research and publication, to college administration, shared governance. Uh, uh, policy uh, involvements by, by faculty and students. Um, uh, it extends, and I think uh, one of the arenas where it has become most controversial is in the area of extramural utterances. Eh? And so that's a wide range of, uh, of activities, uh, etc., most, uh, most uh, notably these days on social media. Uh, and, uh, and, and we've seen all sorts of controversy ab about that, and universities. Uh, trying to censure or crack down on faculty members for their uh, their uh, uh, views expressed uh, sometimes in 140 characters <laughs> on Twitter. So, so it's uh, it, I think that's uh, something to bear in mind is that academic freedom is practiced in such a wide range of venues, and that's that's one of the reasons uh, that we have to be <clears throat> very attentive to it and very very uh, uh, conscious of the range of. Uh, of ways in which our academic freedom uh, needs to be uh, protected. And that's my third point, is that academic freedom requires protection. We talk about tenure, we talk about due process, we talk about contractual security. Uh, tenure, contractual security uh, amount to much the same thing. Uh, it's really important to have that uh, as, a, as a means of protecting faculty uh, in their speech and, and students as well. I think uh, benefit from that. Um, and I'm reminded that uh, that uh, uh, Saul Gittleman at Tufts University wrote just re not so long ago, <clears throat> academic freedom uh, uh, is what made America's universities the, the, the best in the world. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, that that reality is dying by attrition when 70 percent of our uh, instruct uh, instructional uh, workforce lack uh, academic freedom mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a meaningful sense. So, um, 
So I think that's a, that's an important point to to, uh, to remember. Um, you know, uh, there are lots of national issues out there, uh, and we've seen them uh, uh, profiled uh, quite a bit recently: ideology and free speech, Ann Coulter, Milo Yiannopoulos uh, at Berkeley. <laughs> uh, 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 there's uh, there, there are problems of uh, censorship and alternative facts. Uh, and we've seen some of that deployed in the case of Laura Kipnis and Alice Dreger uh, at Northwestern, uh, etc. Uh, problems of pedagogy, freedom to teach. Nate Bork is, is, a, is a good example, as we have, I think, nationwide, of that particular issue. Um, and he'll be uh, speaking on that this morning. Uh, due process protection, safe spaces, uh, what I call the federal educational industrial complex, and how that uh, uh, weighs down on administrations and uh, seems to, to, to compel them to, to uh, try to restrict uh, academic freedom in, in various ways, uh, etc., to protect their, their, their federal uh, research dollars. Uh, um, I think that's a, a very serious issue these, these days. It shows up in institutional review boards, in Title, Title IX, and various other uh, uh, protocols within the university. Um, you know, I think of Colorado as, as a microcosm <laughs> of these national issues. Uh, we've seen everything. Uh, we've seen, just, just to run down a little laundry list, and some of you are, are aware of this, uh, but uh, uh, we, we've seen uh, persona non grata policies at Adams State. <laughs> uh, we've seen the, pro the, 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 the uh, problems associated with uh, an effort to just question or challenge uh, pedagogical protocols in our community colleges, and, and Nate's an example of that. Uh, we've seen uh, people penalized and punished for, the, for just speaking out and expressing their uh, their, their points of view, uh, uh, sometimes in a highly charged national uh, cultural context. Uh, and that word Churchill is, a, is an absolute sort of the, the poster child for that. Um, we've seen, uh, and, and Ward is, is also a poster child for the, I think, the, the, the abuse of uh, academic and, and research integrity policies uh, on, on university campuses. Um, uh, we've seen people. Um, punished uh, for uh, just speaking out forcefully about university policy. Cameron Sahami is a, a good example of that, that issue in our own, own conference, uh, et cetera. Uh, we have universities going ahead without consulting the faculty and engaging in shared governance, uh, enacting policies that are really quite punitive and, uh, and allow uh, just a wide range of accusations to surface and, and, uh, and, and, and be deployed uh, against faculty uh, uh, on our uh, uh, campuses state, statewide. The bullying policies that we're dealing with at Colorado State are of that sort. Uh, we've had uh, uh, different points of view uh, uh, criticized uh, just on the basis of ideology. Uh, and uh, uh, Mitchell uh, uh, was a good example of that on this campus. Um, and uh, and, and at CU, there are other instances. And, uh, and, and we've seen universities try to eliminate shared governance altogether, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the, the core protections that we have for academic freedom is uh, our ability to participate uh, in the design and execution of policies uh, on university campuses. So, so uh, you know, I think that, that, that Colorado is a microcosm of the nation as a whole, uh, and, uh, and, and we've seen everything over the last decade in this con conference. We all, people in this room have worked uh, in various ways on any number of these issues. Uh, so, uh, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. I think we're going to have a rich discussion, and, and, uh, and as the, the weather abates and more people trickle in, I think, I think it will get richer. So. Uh, so, so thanks to everybody for pitching in and making this happen, and uh, I'm going to just turn it over to uh, our first panel. <laughs> thanks for showing up. Uh, I'm Don Iran. I'm the, actually the treasurer of the CU chapter of the AAUP. I'm also on the executive committee of the state conference. And uh, I think, as, as Steve may have mentioned, Jamor Churchill is going to going to speak later this afternoon. And yesterday I heard from a colleague who asked me if CU gave us any trouble about 
having Laura Churchill speak on campus, and I, I said, no, no, they didn't, but they did arrange for this blizzard. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that to go over. So yeah. yeah, I'm really excited about this first uh, first panel. Not so much for the for the issue itself, diversity, which does interest me, but because of the people on the panel, who I, I think are extraordinary. Um, Claude Destry, if he ever shows up, I'm going to introduce him. But I'm going to dispense with him until he shows up. And I, first, I'd like to introduce uh, E. Christian Kopf. Christian Kopp. He's a classic professor at CU. He's been at CU since 1973. That's before I was born, 44 years. Um, he's, uh, he's published over 100 articles and reviews on scholarly, pedagogical, and popular topics. One of his books is The Devil Knows Latin, Why America Needs the Classical Tradition, had at least three editions. Uh, he's the two-time winner of the SOAR Award. It's a now defunct award. But it was pretty much the preeminent teaching award at CU Boulder, S O A R, Student Organization for Alumni Relations. He has a blog called The Imaginative Conservative. I hope he doesn't mind my saying this, but for many, many years he's sort of been the, the campus conservative, for, for lack of a better term. Um, is, that, is that a bad term? <laughs> no, it's not a bad term. Okay. Every good school has one, but not <laughs> this more. Is than our, one. This is ours. This is ours. I, I, I do want to say that about 10 years ago, I, uh, Suzanne Hudson and I wrote a report about an instructor at CU Boulder who was an outspoken conservative who I very much believe was uh, fired for his conservative views. Not that he spoke them in the classroom, but because he spoke them at faculty meetings and made people uncomfortable. And in the, source, in the course of writing this report, I, one thing I discovered is that uh, for many, many conservative faculty on campus, and uh, many conservative students, Chris Kopp is a, a, a source of uh, infinite support. And I've always appreciated that about him. And I uh, very much look forward to hearing him talk. Peter Benilla, to my left here, is the Vice President of Programs for FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. It's a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization, as most of you know committed to defending academic freedom of speech, due process, academic freedom, it said all the stuff that we're, that we're here for today. Um, he has spoke often on radio, print, and television media. He's lectured quite a bit on free speech and academic freedom issues to students and faculty around the country. He's a, an award-winning playwright. He was uh, once on Jeopardy in 2000. I say, how many of you have tried out for Jeopardy online? I have, at least twice. <laughs> Now, and they, and they, they always cheat. The computer always cheats and I never get called. I don't know how he managed. Anyway, um, he's also a, just, recently he's been a real champion of Alice Drager and uh, Laura Kipnis. And I don't know, have any of you ever read Laura Kipnis' book, Unwanted Advances, Sexual Paranoia on Campus? Maybe I, I've read it. If you read reviews, it'll say that a lot of it's exaggerated and that there's stuff in it that almost everyone can find to disagree with. I read this book, I didn't find it was exaggerated. There was nothing in it with which I disagreed. Anyway, I'm very much looking forward to Peter Vanilla talking. And now that brings us to Marky Lecomte. She's uh, everybody's hero and role model at CU. Um, she's the president of our CU chapter of the AAUP. Uh, she was at one time the president of the Council on Anthropology and Education for the American Anthropology, Anthropology Association. She was for many years the uh, editor of the flagship journal of the American Educational Research Association called the Review of Educational Research. Uh, she's the winner of the George and Louise Spindler Award for Lifetime Contributions to the Field of Educational Anthropology. Look her up on Google Scholar sometime. I'm going to give you some numbers. 3,867, that's the number of citations for one of her books. 2,025, that's the number of citations for another of her books or articles. 1,543, that's another. 1,145, that's another. 1,612, but I shouldn't count that because she was just the third author on that one. Okay. She's had us about oh, 15 or 20 other publications that have at least 100 citations, but in case you're feeling threatened, 
None of them had more than 602 citations. <laughs> okay, I know this varies from field to field, but I just want you to keep this in mind when she finally gets around to what she's talking about. <clears throat> And she's going to talk about the sort of plight that some women face in academia, in advancing their careers. This is a renowned scholar in the field of uh, sociology and education. Anyway, it's, it's, it's going to be my pleasure to hear this panel, and uh, let's go to it. <coughs> so, <coughs> Chris, you want to go first? Sure, why not? Thanks. Uh, great to be here this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, Beautiful Colorado late April snowstorm. We Colorado April comes in like a lamb, it goes out like a lion. So we're, we're allowed to, to experience that today. The current crisis in American academia is characterized by several syndromes. The most noticed one is the violence and rioting that have occurred on several campuses in the effort to keep those campuses free from alternative ideas or opinions. But the more pervasive and serious syndrome, in my opinion, is the imposition of a narrow professionalism and a PC multicultural orthodoxy to eliminate alternative viewpoints from the teaching and research mission of the university. It's common to lament that this suppression of diverse opinions is recent, but I don't think so. It goes back at least to Lionel Trilling's great work of cultural genocide, The Liberal Imagination was published in 1950, where Trilling proclaimed, I am now quoting, quotes, in the United States at this time, it was published in 1950, quotes, in the United States at this time, liberalism is not only the dominant, but even the sole intellectual tradition. For it is a plain fact that nowadays there are no conservative or reactionary ideas in general circulation. The conservative impulse and the reactionary impulse do not, with some isolated and ecclesiastical exceptions, express themselves in ideas, but only in action or in irritable mental gestures which seek to resemble ideas." End quotes. These comments were published a few years after Richard Weaver's Ideas Have Consequences and C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, two of the founding works of the 20th century conservative movement and Lewis's case a continuing bestseller. <clears throat> Despite Trilling's language of merely describing the plain fact, its intent was to legitimize an intellectual purge of conservative and traditionalist teachers and scholars because their research and thinking were only, quotes, irritable mental gestures which seek to resemble ideas, the end, end quotes. The result is today's PC University with its oppressive climate of intellectual conformity and reign of terror against any and every dissent, no matter how mild or faint-hearted. A few years ago, Jeffrey Hart of Dartmouth expressed the hope that what he called the ideology of multiculturalism would come to an end because, in his words, <coughs> quotes, it's been subject to a devastating intellectual critique. Well, <coughs> Professor Hart was half right. We won the argument, but we lost the war. Positions not just of power, but even assistant and associate professors filled with like-minded leftists. Hart notes correctly <coughs> students do not willingly take multicultural courses unless compelled by requirements. He's absolutely right. But the power and the will to introduce and enforce those requirements are there, and the conservative or traditionalist voices that might be raised against them have been excluded. Multiculturalism does not mean intellectual diversity. So let me give an example from our own faculty. Faculty of CU Boulder's College of Arts and Sciences is in the process of changing its core curriculum distribution requirements to a general education model. There will be no requirements, specific areas, but students will have to take 12 hours of approved courses in humanities, social sciences, and sciences. De facto, 13 hours in sciences because a four-hour lab exam requirement. The one exception to the specific area norm is diversity, where six hours of approved courses will be required. In the document on which the faculty voted, Appendix B, Diversity Requirement, page 5, the last sentence of the second paragraph reads, quotes, generally courses will explore the ways in which marginalization has occurred and the reasons for this marginalization, end quotes. 
And this document was presented to the Arts and Science Council on April the 21st, 2016. This sentence was the subject of considerable discussion led by members of the philosophy department. The strategy was not to object to the sentence as inconsistent with the norms of the liberal education. That would have been a non-starter. Instead, they argued the sentence was unfair to philosophy because in their field, courses are taught to explore issues and not to mandate a conclusion. Therefore, this sentence would prevent philosophy courses, some of which already exist, from being approved for the new diversity requirement. The committee responsible for writing the new requirement objected successfully to removing the sentence, but promised that philosophy courses that met the current diversity requirement would be grandfathered in. The sentence, they said, was indispensable because it was important to state explicitly that courses that satisfied the new diversity requirement were generally teaching students what to think, not how to think. While I applaud the transparency and honesty of the faculty of the College of Arts and Science, I consider it somewhat supererogatory since faculty teaching courses on diversity are not likely to fail to mention and even dwell on the plight of minorities in the United States. A few years ago, Arts and Sciences was beginning the first round of the Regent mandated program review process in the social sciences, and they were devoting a whole day to the different departments in those areas, introduce themselves and present their strengths and missions. A representative of one especially open department was not ashamed to tell the group, let's face it folks, we're not here to present some kind of impartial view of social reality. We teach to change hearts and minds. It's true in my freshman course, some students are hesitant to accept. They may even first object to the idea that America is basically a Nazi regime. They soon learn after the midterm. By the time of the final, they all accept the idea and expound on it in their final exams. So I waited patiently for the discussion session when someone would stand up and proclaim that in their field taught students to evaluate facts and think critically about them, not to mandate conclusions. Uh, on this topic, in the words of mathematician Charles Dodson, who you may know of as Lewis Carroll, there was silence supreme, not a shriek not a scream, scarcely even a howl or a groan. Faculty discussion was devoted to getting the administration to fund more interdisciplinary courses. Few colleagues are as clear about what we're doing as this one was. Most sincerely believe they're open to different points of view. Where such exists. Hi, <laughs> there's the rub. Huh? A few years ago, two administrators led an open meeting to discuss how to introduce different voices into our teaching. Um, two respected colleagues tried to introduce some realism into the discussion. They objected that as admirable as it might be to allow different views to be expressed, there were many areas where there was only one reasonable view. For instance, the political scientist said, there's gridlock in Washington, D.C. No one can reasonably argue that gridlock is the fault of the president and not the Tea Party fanatics. You can't have a discussion if there's only one reasonable point of view. Another colleague explained that he taught that the Bible, the basis of some undergraduates' religious faith, was an incoherent mess as shown by a scholarly source criticism of the flood narrative of Genesis 6 through 9, on which he gave us a mini lecture. He was totally unaware that while the old documentary hypothesis of the Pentateuch still has loyal adherents, some of them who teach on this campus, there are excellent scholars who felt the story of Noah told against, not for the theory. Edward Nielsen's famous book on oral tradition. Translated in 1961, Susan Nittich's Ancient Israelite Religion, published by Oxford in 1997. I'm not going to run through bibliography. My point is not to deny that there are right and wrong answers to important questions, but to point out that well-educated and respected colleagues treat open questions as certainties that do not admit of discussion. We actually have some research on why this is. Groupthink has been much studied in the past 60 years. A recent article in The New Yorker for February 27, 2017 by Elizabeth Colbert discussed recent bibliography about the concepts of confirmation bias, which makes it unlikely that evidence will change an individual's mind, and the more social my side bias. That's the new name, which I hadn't heard before. Uh, this seems to be part of human group dynamics. People not only believe what their colleagues and associates believe, but they discount contrary evidence and enjoy even random gossip that confirms their beliefs. Colbert writes about, quotes, research suggesting that people experience genuine pleasure, a rush of dopamine when processing information that supports their beliefs, end quotes. 
This uh, observation seems too good to be true. If it is true, many American academics must be wandering around in a dopamine-induced haze because they mainly hear views that confirm their own opinions. As the research discussed by Elizabeth Colbert makes plain, groupthink plays an important role in maintaining group solidarity and cooperation. And often, it's a good thing. We want sports teams, for instance, and SEAL Team 6 to feel and act like teams. If groupthink functions to allow these teams to accomplish their goals, we can shrug our shoulders at the intellectual loss. Their goals may be hard to accomplish, but they're easy to state. Win the Super Bowl, or win the World Series, or kill Osama bin Laden. Depends which team you're on. Universities, on the other hand, have multiple goals. They teach a wide variety of subjects and traditions. What is the future of a society that purports to value traces the historical connections to consensual institutions, science, the religious traditions of the Bible, when it's lost touch with those traditions, all of them ancient, by the way, and lost touch with accessing those traditions through the liberal arts of grammar, logic, and rhetoric, using language to think critically and express oneself persuasively. Suppose that restoring the mission of the university means allowing into our department's people who believe, for instance, that traditions contain more information, no more, than any individual or group of experts or even generation. That therefore ordinary people whose lives and opinions are guided by traditions no more than groups of experts who are cut off, frankly, have cut themselves off from the wisdom of the past. I uh, recently told an honors student who was an anthropology major that a former honors director was a friend of mine who wrote a popular physical anthropology textbook in 1970. He always told people to buy the first edition if they saw a copy in a used bookstore because the publisher had removed all the non-PC material from the second edition. The student said, these, these books were published in the 1970s? They, yes, I know. Why, he asked, why would anyone read books that old? <laughs> we know so much more than they did. <laughs> End quotes. I guess I could have answered with T.S. Eliot's line, yes, and they are what we know. <laughs> Instead, I smiled and thought to myself of another hero of mine, Hyman Roth. I didn't get angry. I thought to myself, this is the business we've chosen. <laughs> From Godfather Part Two, to those of you <laughs> interested in American literature. The student had learned, after all, the lesson we taught him. Is there, however, a future for universities that have cut themselves off? from diversity of opinion, from most of their nation, and from the wisdom of the past, even the past of their own fields. I don't think there is, and I don't think there should be. Thank you for your polite attention. Stand so okay. that so that I'm visible from from behind there. Mm. Is it my car? Uh, There'd be a light if it is. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, my my undergraduate major was theater, so if I can't reach the back of this room without the microphone, then. <laughs> <laughs> the, then, then I should I should be deeply ashamed of myself. Um, uh, first, uh, I, I want to thank the organizers of, of this symposium for for inviting Fire to participate. Um, um, I have a, a particular appreciation for um, the Colorado Conference of the AAUP, which has, uh, in my years uh, at Fire, shown itself to be one of uh, one of the more outspoken and more and more vigorous protectors of uh, of academic freedom. Ooh. <laughs> and one of the most acrobatic. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's shown, um, it has shown a, a, a refreshing independence and, and, uh, and an admirable vigorousness in, um, in defending the rights of the faculty under its watch. Um, and in my, uh, in my 
years at FIRE, I've been there since 2008, um, and the, in the last several years I've investigated quite a lot of cases involving academic freedom issues for faculty. Um, I, I've gotten to know uh, a number of the people with the executive committee uh, of the Colorado Conference, so I'm, I'm very glad to be able to be out here and, and meet some of them in, in, in person, uh, and, and hopefully um, have a, a, a few thoughts worth sharing. Um, you know, when I, um, when I, I was emailing with Don earlier in the week um, about the topic for the panel, diversity and academic freedom, um, and I asked Don, um, Joe, any, any, any particular tech I, I should take? And, and he was just like, oh, you know, just, it's diversity. Um, just feel free to run with it. Mm -hmm. um, which is its own kind of challenge, um, because uh, at, at FIRE, um, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, um, you know, there is, you know, we are strong defenders of, of, of free speech and academic freedom and due process for students and faculty at universities around the country. Um, there is no in-house, um, there is no in-house position on diversity, um, you know, or even what it is. Um, uh, and yet, issues of, um, issues of, of relating to diversity writ large, um, loom over our work pretty frequently, um, including our work, um, including our work with faculty. Um, you know, one of um, you know one of the issues that has been um, has been getting a lot more attention from the mainstream press. Um, I think in the last six months, uh, in um, in uh, that time, we've all been re, re uh, adjusting our equilibriums after the the 2016 election. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of mainstream attention um, paid to to issues such as what uh, what Professor Kopp was talking about. Um, you know, a lack of kind of ideological or political diversity among faculty. Um, you know, the the sort of ideological monoculture um, taking uh, that that's taken hold in universities, and you know, and what that might mean for universities' long term future. Um, you know, these are things that. Um, you know, we're, we're suddenly being written about uh, by people like Nick Kristof from the New York Times, uh, and, and you know, there, there was a, a, uh, all of a sudden a big plea to, to kind of have a reckoning with the sort of, the, the sort of culture that we have in the university. So that was, um, you know, that was a, a very interesting change, um, a, a very interesting um, act of, of introspection. Um, and, you know, when it comes to, um, when it comes to diversity of, of, of that nature, um, you know, again, the, the fire, um, the standard fire position is that um, the, there is no standard fire position other than to say um, that, you know, efforts at improving the kind of um, diversity of belief, diversity of ideology, background, et cetera, um, among faculty will always have to contend with um, the academic freedom norms that faculty enjoy when it comes to, um, when it comes to, um, appointing new scholars and promoting them and granting them tenure or not, um, the expertise of, of the faculty which has long been given deference um, in these decisions uh, and, and which, um, and, and which uh, in my opinion should be and I think the, the opinions of, of pretty much everyone else here. Um, you know, it, it, it's one thing for, um, uh, it, it's one thing for people like Nick Kristof to write about how um, how this kind of lack of diversity in, among the faculty is, is something that is, that could have worrisome effects down the road um, for for the academy, and it's it's quite another for uh, for politicians to threaten uh, a university's uh, state funding if they don't appoint more conservatives to its faculty. That opens itself another entire can of worms, um, which which I'm not very eager to see the bottom of. Um, you know, one thing I was noting, and I was I was taking some uh, some notes on this, uh, on the extent to which college and academic culture uh, has become a more mainstream concern um, in the last few years. Um, my my go-to barometer um, for this uh, is now and always has been um, the coverage these issues get in the Onion. Um, I was looking at some of I was looking at some some, some of the headlines to refresh myself, and some of the ones I came across were. Uh, college encourages lively exchange of idea. Uh, uh, another one recently, uh, Berkeley campus on lockdown after loose pages from Wall Street Journal found on park bench. Uh, uh, one, uh, parents dedicate new college safe space in honor of daughter who felt weird in class once. Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, another one, which I'd missed, um, which was amazing because I read The Onion five or six times a day. Um, college professor reminds students it will take a few classes to memorize everyone's triggers. Um, and this sort of brings, this sort of, you know, brings me out of the, out of the issues of, of kind of ideological and viewpoint diversity um, to some of the more um, some of the more broad issues that, that universities and, and especially university faculties are, are facing, um, which is, you know, where their academic freedom and their right, uh, you know, their freedom either uh, intramural or extramural expression, freedom to teach, freedom to research, etc. Um, you know, where where it intersects with um, with these other campus values. Um, um, Diversity being one of many, the right to the right to an environment free of harassment, the right to an environment free of violence, um, and it's something that I can I can say from my last several years of, of work at Fire, investigating quite a number of, of faculty cases, um, really go uh, taking a fine tooth uh, a fine tooth comb to to a lot of the files generated by them, trying to trying to understand, trying to research the issues. Um, Quite often, um, having to do um, you know, quite often having to do with um, faculty expression on things like social media, um, which is a, a major concern. The effects, um, you know, the, the the sort of instant viral sensation effects of of what anyone might say. Um, you know, we we have a kind of local celebrity in Phil in Philadelphia, a Drexel professor named George Cicciarello Mar, um, who has on a, a couple of occasions. Um, Posted things to his, his Twitter account, um, um, you know, denigrating the alt right, denigrating the military, um, and the, these go um, these go viral and, and arouse outrage in all the in all the predictable ways and in all the predictable venues. Um, and it's 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 a game change. It, it's something that um, you know. It, it's something that you know that that. that you know, definitely the people, the people here who have, who have been on, on university faculties for a long time didn't have to reckon with when, when they got here. Um, you know, the, the idea that what you say from your Twitter account in Iowa might, uh, might be causing a stink in Florida or New York or California or, or halfway around the world. Um, like I said, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated topic. Um, Diversity writ large, um, and I don't want to. I don't want to go on too too long because uh, I, I can probably be more useful to the room, um, assuming we open this up to questions and answers, uh, and we get to and we get to discuss some of your concerns in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, one um, one thing that um, that I think gets a little bit. Um, well, I won't say it gets too little attention, but it's it's, it's sometimes forgotten in, in the debate. Um, is um, is the extent to which you know when it when it comes to when it comes to promoting academic freedom and promoting it as 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 a value that is a good in itself um, you know whose value is self evident which I believe um, we we need to pay attention also I think to creating that culture of respect for academic freedom not just not not among the faculty. Um, where I think it is widely understood, obviously, but among the students as well, that, that, there, that there is not perhaps that student culture of understanding the values of academic freedom, of understanding why um, it has legitimate pedagogical cultural value for, um, for a professor of sociology or women's studies or film studies to take their students into um, you know, into exploring issues that could be potentially um, that, that could be shocking, that could be quite disturbing, that could um, you know that could raise a lot of kind of intellectual discomfort. Um, as universities get more and more expensive, even at the even at the state level, I don't know um, I, I don't know what it costs a, a student in Colorado um, to attend a place like uh, like CU Boulder, uh, other than to say a lot more than it once did. Um, you know, when you have um, universities at, you know, costing, you know, sixty upwards of seventy thousand dollars a year um, for tuition and room and board and everything else, including you know the 90, 98 foot climbing walls in the in the student unions, um, 
you know, when, when the bottom line is that much for the students, um, I think the, the consumer politics of the issue play more, play more of a role. There becomes more of that sense, why, why, should, we, um, why should we be told by you what we have to learn, that, we, you know, that this has value, that that has value, we're the ones paying the tuition, uh, you kind of work for us in this equation. Um, there are a lot of there there are a lot of those kinds of tensions, um, and and it sort of you know in my opinion explodes the, the you know any easy questions of diversity because it's um, you know the the only thing that I've become convinced of in my nine years at Fire in my seven years there which I spent investigating individual cases of censorship individual cases of cases of punishment uh, or retaliation for um, for expression that kind of upset the university apple cart in one way or another is that. Um, the issues are more complex and more multifaceted than, than I thought they could have been at the beginning. Um, this, you know, this is not, I will say, the greatest endorsement of my skills uh, or my qualifications for being here, coming, uh, coming two thirds of the way across the country to tell uh, to tell a room of, of scholars. Um, essentially, it's complicated, um, <laughs> but it is. Uh, it is an incredibly complicated issue. Um, it isn't something, um, you know, when it comes to diversity and academic freedom, you know, in, in the same way with, uh, with diversity and free speech in general. They aren't, um, they aren't concepts that ideally should ever have to exist in tension, and yet they frequently do. Um, universities have multiple interests uh, at, at stake. Creating an open intellectual environment, uh, an environment of rigorous discourse, um, intellectual exploration, um, the ability to to question your most deeply held assumptions, but also a place where, um, also a place where students feel welcome and valued and included, and where they don't feel um, written off due to prejudices based on race or religion or gender or sexual orientation, um, and. You know those tensions aren't um, aren't anything new. Um, you know they were litigated extensively in the 1980s and the 1990s when a lot of college speech codes aimed at sort of um, creating this kind of uh, this kind of balance with with diversity and free speech and academic freedom. When a lot of these speech codes were, were litigated um, on First Amendment grounds and and pretty much uniformly they went down in court um, because they couldn't sustain a court challenge because as they were written. Um, as they were written, they um, uh, they were unconstitutional um, and and you know pretty clearly so. Um, the last the, the last thing I'll say, and this is um, you know this sort of takes um, you know this sort of takes a lot of the um, the you know a lot of the arguments um, and the the familiar arguments and um, placing a value on diversity and inclusion. Um, you know everyone has been. Um, you know, er everyone I'm sure has, has seen, um, you know, has, has seen the reports of, of what went on at places like Berkeley when, Mi when Milo Yiannopoulos um, visited um, and wasn't able to deliver his speech. Uh, when Charles Murray visited Middlebury College um, and, and was, um, you know, ended up having to uh, give, his, uh, give his lecture essentially in private. Um, before he and, his, and, and the faculty member who, um, who was uh, accompanying him and, and who was hosting, uh, um, was hosting the event for him um, were accosted on their way back to, uh, back to their vehicle and, and the professor actually sustained fairly serious injuries, had to wear a neck brace and suffered a, con a concussion. Um, and while this has been going on, the familiar, um, familiar rhetoric of, um, of you know, this, um, this person's ideas, this person's speech is is offensive or unwelcome. It's been elevated from that to um, to this person's speech is an active act of uh, you know is an active act of violence against uh, against us. Um, even being you know this person being allowed to be on our campus um, is an active act of violence um, against uh, against us. Um, and that you know w w what connection that way you know that has to um, places like Middlebury, um, places you know, places like Berkeley. You know, they're not the only places where where that kind of rhetoric has, has taken hold. Um, but you know, we, I think it's fair to, to question whether they exist on a continuum that that starts with um, you know starts with 
um, students saying this speech is violent. Um, it creates a it, it creates a, not just an emotionally but a physically unsafe environment for us. Um, uh, even if we aren't, uh, even if we don't attend a person's lecture, even if we don't participate in, in this professor's class, um, you know, we, even if we don't listen to this speaker, um, just the very fact that they're there creates a physically uh, a physically unsafe environment for us. You know, when um, you know when things like that, which are you know, which are in, in our experience pretty new, there are only th you know there, there are only arguments that I that I see really having taken hold, probably in the last maybe two or three years. Um, it is a it, it is a fairly new phenomenon, um, and I think whether that exists on on the continuum that starts with that and ends with justifications of physical violence to keep um, to keep certain people to keep certain voices um, off a of university campus. Um, you know, I, I think it's you know I, I I I worry that they exist on the continuum. It's very difficult to quantify, um, and the more. Um, the more news coverage I read of, of these heated environments, you know what it was like being at Berkeley in, in the last couple of days. It's it's difficult to fathom. It's difficult to understand. And, and you know I you know the only thing I can conclude when I get to the end of reports like that is be like, wow, thank God I'm three thousand miles away from all of that right now. Um, <clears throat> I think at this point, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to pass the microphone. These have been um, some very, you know, some, some fairly unorganized thoughts, uh, thoughts by me. I'll, I'll do better during the question and answer. And I'm, I'm here, um, I'm here all, all during the day, and happy to, to speak with uh, to speak with everyone. I want to make, a, if I if I may, a, a brief uh, um, a brief pitch. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk with people uh, about this later uh, later in the day. Um, um, you know, FIRE has been around for, um, this is our 18th year, um, and faculty outreach from day one has always been a very important part of our mission. Um, and we're taking that a step further this year um, by, for the first time ever, hosting a conference for faculty, which we will be doing uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in the fall. Um, and we are um, looking to have a, a, a number of discussions on a variety of academic freedom topics led by faculty, centered around faculty, um, it, it's uh, it, it's a first of a kind conference for us, um, but um, so far the the response that we've had, um, the interest that it's generated from faculty has been very mm -hmm. encouraging. Um, it, it's really um, you know sent the message to us that these are um, issues that really bear discussion um, and which don't um, don't have enough outlets for that discussion. So uh, I'm happy to to discuss that more privately with everyone here. But I wanted uh, you know I feel like I'd be derelict in my duties not to make the pitch for it um, from here. Um, um, so that that's it for me. But uh, I look forward to I, I look forward to taking the questions and I look forward to talking to you um, in the course of the day. So again, thank you very much for inviting. Me. I'm going to stand up also because I'm tired of sitting. Um, I'm very glad to see all of you here in spite of the weather, which we seem to bring around always for our conferences. We even have one called the Snowflake Conference that <laughs> is organized, and it always snows. Um, I'm going to talk about being a woman in higher education because that's the aspect of diversity that I represent, and I think an older woman at this point. But I want to use that aspect to highlight how all kinds of demographic diversity are required to support the kind of academic freedom that intellectual diversity requires. So just imagine that I'm not here, that I'm invisible, and that the other colleagues on this panel are all middle-aged white men. <coughs> because that is how the demography of higher education looked when I was in graduate school and in my first jobs. Um, any the play conference I went to, any place, I was the only girl in the room and amongst a lot of older white men. So being the only woman on this male-oriented panel harks back to those bad old days when every class I took was taught by white males and every conference I went to was dominated by them. When I got my first job at the illustrious University of Houston, the whole department and most of the the deans and administrators in the college were comprised of white males. And I was only hired because the department was under sanction and we were going to lose money for not hiring women and minorities. So they hired me and a black man who lasted about three years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is creepy. <laughs> 
<laughs> He's invisible. Just, just That's right. right. He's not there. Okay. Um, anyway, Howard Hill, a black man who uh, was let go allegedly because he was preaching black power and revolution in his to his students. What he was really talking about was the experience of black children in elementary schools. And I, I knew that because we taught in this big open space. His classroom was there, and mine was there, and I could hear every word he said. And then three years later, I was denied tenure because I didn't have a research lifestyle. Didn't, a direct quote. I think that that meant that I didn't have the right genitalia to be on the faculty, or that I was, a, I was not a guy, and so I didn't have a guy's lifestyle. One of my colleagues later lamented to me that we never thought we'd have to deal with tenure for you because you're so young and pretty, we thought you'd get married and we would never have to deal with you. <laughs> so I filed an EEOC lawsuit, and it's a lawsuit for discrimination. And as a result, I was blacklisted in the entire great state of Texas because the EEOC and the courts were all stacked by graduates from the University of Houston. And basically, I had become unhirable in Texas. So what does this have to do with academic freedom? Being denied tenure because of who one is demographically or lifestyle-wise deprives the ac academy of the diversity of outlook and perspective that fosters true intellectual development. Things have changed quite a lot since then, more or less. Women and minorities are now more visibly present most faculties now have at least a few women and minorities. I did get hired five years later at CU after going to the Houston School District um, because of the pioneering research I was doing on research methods um, and also because I had some uh, women friends on the faculty. Women now outnumber men in undergraduate life and in graduation. More and more women are entering the ranks of graduate schools, even in science, technology, engineering, and math. And women are forming their own old girl networks from among their colleagues and former, former students, and that is one of the reasons I'm here. <clears throat> However, they still haven't moved into leadership roles in anything like representative numbers, the full professors, department chairs, deans, heads of important committees, or presidents of universities. Their pay still lags far behind men, even for the same work. And they're still women are still loaded into the lower ranks of instructors or in, in part-time or contingent faculty who teach the majority of all the courses. Even here at CU, it's more than 91%, 71% of all the classes. So our undergraduates can go through without ever seeing a tenure-track professor. <clears throat> And overt sexual harassment like that at Fox News and that bragged about by our trumpeter-in-chief still exists, mm -hmm. although perhaps not quite so overtly. Uh, I think Laura Kipnis might argue against that. For academic freedom, this means that leadership roles within the academy are still limited to people with a specific and a more limited perspective, the white male point of view, and hence alternative perspectives are less likely to be supported. More important, the disadvantage in pay, leadership roles, and recognition suffered by women persists, and it's aggravated by a prevailing culture that remains tone deaf to the differences in lifestyles between men and women. As I think about that crack, about my lack of a research lifestyle, I've begun to realize that what that meant was that as a woman, I probably would have children, and if I had children, I couldn't be wholeheartedly committed to the university 24-7, like men who have wives to be their support systems, type their papers, care for their children, uh, cook the meals, and even hold down a second job to supplement the male's meager salary as a university professor. Without a wife, I wouldn't be able to attend overnight faculty retreats or late night meetings or work every day in the weekend. Complaints I heard repeatedly by my young colleagues who were single mothers. As a woman, I also couldn't hang out in the men's room where so many good conversations took place. And I really didn't like golf or bass fishing, which are very big in Texas, or football, which is even bigger. So I wasn't very interesting to talk to. <clears throat> if I were single, and even if I weren't, I was always seen first through the lens of being a sexual object, and only afterwards as a colleague, collaborator, or potential leader. 
It also meant that I didn't have that old boys network to cheer me on and upon which I could rely for important career information and connections and cover-ups also if I perhaps transgressed some social or other kinds of rules. Further, volunteering to be department chair or head of graduate studies seldom produced results as men dominated these entry-level leadership positions. These small sl slights being overlooked or forgotten about, or finding that key events are scheduled when you're unable to t attend because of family obligations, and the list goes on and on and on, becomes a kind of death by a thousand cuts. Addish additionally, there are two structural factors that mitigate against increasing the number of women in higher ed in Colorado and elsewhere. First is the vocationalization and corporatization of universities, in which STEM fields are privileged vastly over the arts, education, humanities, and even social sciences, fields in which women are more predominant. The STEM fields are hiring, the latter ones are not. Secondly, the tenure lines that produce academic leadership are disappearing, not only in a concerted attack on tenure, but in budget cuts that replace tenure track positions with rotating pools of part-time and non-tenure track instructors who are increasingly populated by women. The tenured faculty who are left, left are those with the most seniority and they tend to be the same white males who originally held those positions. So what does this have to do with academic freedom? If people who look like you, and you don't look like a white guy, and who share your interests and research fascinations are not present in the academy, you are not likely to enjoy as much support in or freedom to pursue the intellectual pursuits that differ from the mainstream of your institution. In addition, here in Colorado, we have become aware that new and insidious ways to discriminate against or harass faculty members have emerged uh, not only here but elsewhere. Among these include accusing faculty of violating institutional review board um, regulations and procedures when, in fact, the activities in which faculty were involved did not constitute research. It has also involved the hijacking of Title IX, which originally was designed as a remedy for overt sex, to sex discrimination against and sexual abuse of women. Now, however, it seems that women are being accused of establishing hostile environments in their classrooms or their labs, or being defined as equal opportunity abusers who have engaged in sexual abuse or harassment of their male students, an act which warrants their dismissal or at least suspension from their classrooms and labs. The case of sociologist Patty Adler here at CU is instructive. Patty is an award-winning professor, prolific researcher, and she had taught a course in social deviance, a good sociological course, um, to, for decades to great acclaim with no complaints. She covered many forms of social deviance, including the topic of prostitution, and she had long had students role play various women describing how they actually got into the sex trade. In the fall of 2013, Adler was accused of violations on two count, accounts. First, it was alleged that she had violated institutional review pro protocols regarding getting informed consents for her students for participation in the role play. This is not research. No consent was required of that kind. And second, the classroom role play violated federal sexual harassment policies forbidding the establishment of a, sex, a hostile environment which offended her students. One person who was not a student was the person who filed the complaint. Adler was removed from teaching that class because of the alleged student's complaints to the Office of Conduct and Discrimination. But the outcry over her treatment was nationwide. The Colorado Conference filed protests with the CU administration, and the university ultimately reversed its decision and returned Patty to the classroom. But the entire experience was so horrific that she retired the next semester. So what does this have to do with academic freedom? Perhaps most important is that at Adler's freedom to teach in ways that she, as a professional, thought most appropriate was, was egregiously violated. Less dramatically, here at CU, I was warned against continuing a practice I routinely engaged in, inviting my doctoral and master's degree students over on a regular basis for spaghetti dinners, where we talked about their, their thesis and dissertation projects and uh, innovations and research methods, which is one of my areas of expertise. 
I modeled my actions on the most rewarding experience I had myself as a grad student at the University of Chicago, where my advisor did the same thing on a monthly basis. The students I met there became my reference group for my entire career. But here at CU, I was told it might appear that I was hitting on the male students, or that they might hit on me. Highly unlikely, but, but I didn't stop, <laughs> because holding intellectual conversations out of the classroom with my own groups of students certainly is not improper. But other women faculty who have sem held similar seminars who have presided over labs or working groups have not been so lucky. They have been accused of all sorts of unprofessional behavior and have received negative sanctions. The thing to note is that laws passed to protect women now have been discovered to be useful to administrators who want to get rid of them. What does this mean for academic freedom? In the 1960s, when I was a grad student, having informal seminars with faculty members was an honored way for faculty to build students' intellectual networks and explore ideas. Now these avenues are being seen as dangerous, not because they foster academic and intellectual freedom to explore ideas, but because they are seen through the lens of inappropriate sexual conduct, and I think this is very dangerous. So it becomes this kind of a litany. First, they simply don't hire women. Then they simply won't retain them. Then when they do hire them, they're never promoted or they're relegated to instructor roles. And once they did begin to get tenure, it's death by a thousand cuts. You still feel invisible, even as someone like myself, who's well known in my field and is at leadership positions in my field, towards the end of my career, because it took me a long time to overcome the uh, large cuts that basically took me out of higher ed for a number of years. <clears throat> Even if tenure is granted, the academic culture is still not structured to support anyone who lacks the privilege of those who initially created it, whether they are women, people of color, gender nonconforming, religiously observant in non-Judeo-Christian traditions, or whatever. So while there has indeed been change, we still have a long way to go. And as the signs I saw in the spring 2017 Women's March said, I can't believe I still have to protest this shit. <laughs> And some of this shit, of course, involves intellectual diversity. Every time you bring another group that isn't middle-aged white men into an organization, the kinds of intellectual and other questions that get raised change and get broader, because the people who are different have interests and concerns that the old white guys just don't think are worth bothering with. Without apology to the old white guys in this room. <laughs> to the extent that diverse people are excluded, intellectual freedom is stifled. And with regard to the academic hierarchy, failing to take seriously new ideas and new areas of investigation is indeed detrimental to the academy. So let me make an analogy. In agriculture, farmers are increasingly realizing that monoculture is uninteresting. It isn't creative. It stifles innovation and productivity. It's bad for the environment. It even can foster the more rapid spread of disease and lead to extinction. Monoculture in the academy is no different. The white Western European male culture that still prevails in higher education tends to privilege spe specific topics and ways of thinking and conducting investigations that comport with we ma male and Western European American senses of the world. Other ways of knowing or topics not within the mainstream are not considered serious, hard, or worth investigating. I remember when the only time gender figured into research topics was as a variable that affected other more interesting variables, such as income levels or voting preference or propensity to purchase a particular brand of peanut butter or <clears throat> pickup truck. Science was supposedly neutral, so that it was given that studying a topic like menstruation could never be taken seriously. It was unimportant because it only happened to women and also because it was something sort of icky. And any concerns of women share the same lack of self-esteem, a lack of esteem that the women themselves experienced in society. So for centuries, and in most societies, menstruation was deemed by biologists to be an explanation for women's low status. It weakened women sufficiently to make them unfit for leadership roles or careers. Not till women biologists actually began to study menstruation 
did that most normal and necessary phenomena begin to get the respect that it and the women who studied it deserved. Racism wasn't a topic of serious study until people of color got into the academy and began doing it. And then it got to be such a hot topic that white people were left with only their own white privilege to deconstruct. <clears throat> the negative effects of colonial exploitation were ignored or viewed as collateral damage until people who had been colonized started teaching classes on what it did to them and their people. Further, a white male monoculture tends to privilege specific ways of being. So leaders have to look and act like men, even when it's begun to be obvious that the collaborative leadership style more natural to women is better than top-down management styles at fostering the teamwork and distributive cognition most productive of much innovation. So my point is this. <coughs> Intellectual diversity and the creative spirit in general requires and is fostered by academic freedom and vice versa. Is fostered by the contribution of people who are different from each other, but especially from the perspectives that have so predominated in the academy. Good science requires academic freedom. I think we can all agree on that. However, academic freedom fosters a healthy contestation of and interaction with divergent and different ideas. These cannot exist without diversity in the academy. So it's in the interest of all of us to make sure not only that diversity persists, but that it is promoted and encouraged in every modality of diversity that exists. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'd like to, by the way, start our next panel in 15 minutes at 10.30. We do have time for some, some questions here. Uh, by the way, those were, uh, those were three powerhouse presentations. And I mean, if you'd be willing, please write up your remarks and, and send them in. I'd love to publish them on the Colorado AP website or else. Yeah. Here, here. They'll be lost forever. <laughs> I, 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 have a, I have a quick question for Chris Kopf. Um, it, it, it does seem self-evident to me that there's sort of a systemic discouragement for um, conservatives entering academia you know, at every stage. Your presentation seemed pretty bleak about the future. Do you, do you have any optimism that that, that, that status quo might change? Uh, my official position is optimism. But, <laughs> but there ought to be rational reasons behind it if my, if my theories are true. The rational reasons are not good. Uh, specifically at the University of Colorado, Don, you mentioned the Phil Mitchell case. Yeah. This was not only a fantastic teacher, and he's a citizen who spoke up and talked about things, and uh, we were just getting to the stage where people who had different views, conservatives, Christians, they're not the same group, of course, uh, and when Phil was fired, that was the end of that. When those groups meet together, one of the things they agree upon is, I'll never mention my views before my colleagues. So, I mean, obviously, FIRE does this really great job about people who say something, right? And it ranges from legitimate academic scholarship to having a Christmas wish for a white genocide, right? There's a whole range of things people say. But remember, what's, what I find hurting academia is people who are afraid to speak at all. That is, FIRE can't help people who are afraid to speak and don't speak. Unfortunately, I mean, you guys have a great mission. It's clear, and you fulfill your mission. But what I see is the other side. So that's discouraging. Also, the interesting research, and by the way, some of it's done at CU Boulder, on um, groupthink, that as we, the higher our standards, the more we agree, not just on where we're doing academic research, but on everything. And that's the thing that really, uh, this massive research, and the guys in, who are doing this research blame it all on, on primitive apes and the savannah cooperating, you know, things like that. I just can't believe that we're at that level. Uh, but, but it's still true, groupthink is something that is, and it's, it's actually good in the case of teams. But in the case of academia, it needs to be fought. We need to fight against the natural human desire that we all agree on everything and everybody who doesn't agree is an idiot. Or deplorable or whatever, sorry. Can I push back a little bit on that? Sure, I, I don't of course. Want to offend anyone, but um, it, it's watch it, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I mean, 
the, the, the Nick Kristoff piece that seemed to be a somewhat, somewhat of a similar flavor to some, some of your remarks, um, it was in the in Times recently. I mean, I, when I read that piece, I thought, this is just not, not my lived experience of academia. So I'm from CSU Pueblo. Um, we're kind of, you know, we're called a university, we're pretty much a community college um, hiding out in a university context. And so maybe my institution is different from CU Boulder. And of course, in that case, so the majority of student contact hours in the country for higher education are, are in co community colleges. So my experience is really closer to what the majority of students in experience. Um, and also, when I was a student, I was at the sort of fancy R1. So I, I just, that's not my experience. On my campus, the, we, have a, you know, we have evolution deniers in the biology department. We have the one tenured physicist in my department does not give credence to a theories of global climate change. We have you know, the dean of the College of Science and Math to home educates his kids because he doesn't want them expo exposed to, you know, other views. I mean, we have plenty of um, conservative views on my campus. In, in fact, I am very careful about what I say. I'm one of those frothing of the mouth liberals, and, and I'm very careful what I say because I've, I'm sure that many of my colleagues, not most of my colleagues, disagree with almost everything I think about politics. and about other things. I, I, don't, I just, it's not my lived experience. Maybe it, it's here at CU. Um, and, and, that, so, and then, so that's one, one I'd like to hear your, if you think that, that what, how representative these different things are. And the other question I want to put, it, put push back again is um, diversity of opinion. I'm, not, I'm a mathematician. Right? In math we have truth, which I agree other disciplines don't. So it's a little bit biases me a little bit. But, um, you know, um, when diversity of opinion, it seems to me, is kind of a silly thing if there is something that's clearly a better, um, I know I'm falling right into the trap that you've said, but that there's a better interpretation of, uh, you know, I mean, as John Stewart said, reality has a well-known liberal bias. If, 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 um, if there's, if, if, you know, I don't see any reason that a department of uh, non, a non, you know, some department needs to hire someone who has a radically different view simply because it's different if that view is just not academically, um, you know, strongly supportable. It seems to me that was something that you were pushing for diversity, for diversity's sake, whether or not there's any truth in it. One, America has a terrifically large educational establishment. And most conservatives and Christians who get into an academic career hope they can get a job at a Christian school or a small denominational school or somewhere. There's, there's freedom somewhere in America. So if you look at the whole American scene, there is. In terms of the kind of prestige, research, flagship university type schools, what, what I, I believe what I say is true. I think it's, it's absolutely, I mean, this is one reason why kids get, often get a better beginning education at community colleges because they're often uh, bright kids who got a PhD from UT Austin or Madison or CU Boulder, who then, you know, really would never get hired by a, by a prestige place for their views. But they still get a job and they love teaching and they're just as smart, frankly, as people who are going through the tenure track thing. So you, uh, but my experience, and I, I have boys who've taken the courses in, in, the, in, the, in the Texas Community College, and I know people, of course, in Colorado, so you're going to get a great education there on that level, because they don't go on to the next stage. As far as the situation in, in uh, prestige institutions, and Berkeley, you know, is the most prestigious state university in the country, and it's worldwide, the same country. Uh, they just aren't other, everybody thinks the same. And, it, it, and it's on everything, right? I mean, it's across the board. Uh, and people who don't fit into that, or in the case of certain twisted people who consciously look for things where they can disbelieve what reasonable people believe. Um, you really notice the subconscious statements that are made that imply that this is what we all think and we really, you know, no reasonable person is going to, to disagree. Graduate students come and talk to me about it all the time, of course. Because it's not, the, it's not the subject, right? The subject they're looking for originality, for new things. Right? It's, the, it's the collegiality business. This is another good reason to keep, keep someone getting uh, tenured who doesn't fit in, right? Well, they're not collegial. 
They just don't fit. They, exactly. they, they don't fit in, and it's not. There's no intellectual reason for it. I think it's absolutely true that American American education has a lot of diversity in itself. You go the whole range. The closer you get to the top, the less and less there is, and that's where the prestige is. Could I maybe throw one thing in? Um, I don't know. I don't know CSU Pueblo any any better than than I know the, the, than I know the culture of any other university. But I think. And, and, and I, I really had this thought, um, I had this thought after um, I gave a, a talk to some students at Haverford College out in, in uh, the suburbs of, of Philadelphia, um, that there could be, you know, there could be any number of things that, you know, any number of relatively small things that CSU Pueblo could be better at doing than CU Boulder in terms of creating more in, in terms of having a more collegial environment, a more kind of free disagree, a more kind of, um, you know, a, a more kind of diversity of, uh, diversity of viewpoint, diversity of opinion, and feeling, feeling safe to, um, you know, feeling kind of safe and at home to, to be a contrarian, and be outspoken. Um, this isn't really, this isn't a, um, this isn't at all to, to go against your to go against your point, um, but it's something I've been thinking more about lately. Because um, um, when I when I was at when I was at Haverford, um, you know the, um, the 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 caliber of the discussion that I had with the, with the students there was really good. Um, there there was it was a really lively uh, a really lively atmosphere. And I was talking with the with the, the dean of the college uh, about why that was after, and. Um, and her her response, and I thought this was really interesting, was that um, um, you know the the student um, the student disciplinary system you know it's honor code based and it's centered around the students and it's run much more by the students than by people uh, than by people in the central administration, which meant there was no so much less of a culture of of needing the administrators to, to step in and sort things out. There's a, so much more culture of letting the students decide and letting the students reason their way through it. Um, and I came away thinking, like, huh, like that's, that's really interesting and I, and I never thought about that in the context of a university before. Um, it's a little bit tangential to your point, but um, you know, I'm, I'm just leaving open that CSU Pueblo could, could have, it, it could just do a lot of the, the little cultural things better than its peer institutions do. It also could not. You're 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 the you're the expert on on the CSU Pueblo climate, and I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I would say I don't. I don't. I think um, it has not been a benefit to my campus to have these. Um, you know, I don't think it's a benefit to our students that there, we have a biology professor who doesn't believe in evolution. I uh, just don't. Even though he has, you know, he represents a different cultural tradition. He, you know, the tradition, the tra traditional truths of his religious tradition make him um, not a good professor of his discipline. And I think that that's um, not a benefit to my end. Yeah, I don't know, I, I just, I wish we had data on this I, as opposed to a, a lot of anecdote, because I really sure. only have anecdote. And so, you know, I was an undergraduate at Harvard, and it was a thousand years ago, and I, there, was, there was a lot of diversity in, in my circle of friends uh, about political views, and there was a very active, you know, Part of the Republicans organization that we marched against, and you know we had our discussions with. I, I think that the, the the top and the bottom of the United States, in my experience, has been of education um, has been has, has not had this. Maybe there's a maybe there's a part of the, the the educational community in the United States where this is a big problem, but it's certainly not been my experience. Well, good. Thank you. Could I just well now I'm a little embarrassed that I'm jumping in with something that's anecdotal. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I. I wanted to respond to both of you, um, maybe just from a different point of view, but Chris, what you said was so interesting about diversity. I was sitting here thinking about my daughter who's getting ready to graduate from the University of Rochester in New York, and she's studying Deaf Studies, American Sign Language, and Psychology. She's a hearing person. And on the surface, when we went to visit this school, which is, by the way, in your comments, one of those 60K a year schools um, <laughs> that promotes itself as, as diversity, as being what, at the top of the heap, and she was all about that. You know, It's a big deal in our family for other reasons. <coughs> and so we went to visit this school, and they've got a large deaf community, and on the surface level, appears to be incredibly diverse. 
I guess I'm, I'm telling this story just out of a different, um, to express the, what this looks like from an undergraduate point of view, because my daughter calls me upset about this all the time. There is zero diversity within the department. So you have to have the mainline party view on deaf culture, even though she's a hearing person. God forbid you're a student who gets a cochlear implant, they've actually been bullied yeah. off the campus and off the rowing team. So, you know, this is, to me, an example of a school that sometimes diversity, it, it's a lot of speak, it's a lot, it's a lot of labeling, and it, and it looks to be so diverse because we're representing different populations. Yeah. But once you're within that microcosm of the group, the diversity stops there. And in class for four straight years, if she speaks up about a, a different point of view um, at all, even as a hearing person, she's shut down immediately, wow. even by professors. Yeah. So I feel like it, it's actually almost chased her out of the field. She, she wishes that she hadn't gone, which is so great for a tuition paying parent to hear. All <laughs> 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 years and bottle of tequila is about all I want at this point. But it, it, just, it kind of broke my spirit as a, as a college professor and having a daughter who was so excited to go and is so dark and jaded about it now. She's very funny. So a lot of her deaf culture jokes are hysterical, but it's you know they wouldn't appreciate it very much. But I think that you know the example of, of people deciding to do something diverse within their community and being chased out for it, like cochlear implants, is just it, it just everything that you guys are talking about. I think it's important to look at it from what this does to our undergrads as well, you know, and the very people that we're also passionate about, um, you know. So there's my anecdotal evidence. No, I don't. <laughs> I, Further support a lack of actual diversity, though it is spoken about. I know very little. I know very little about deaf culture because I've had I I've, I've had very few personal encounters with it. But I I I remember reading. I don't remember where I read it, but I remember being shocked at the extent to which even basic questions within within the community, such as whether deafness is a disability. Um, yeah, like exactly. just how, how explosively controversial you know, what to an outsider like me seem fairly basic questions. Well, and I have a daughter who is physically disabled, so this is why I said it's a big deal in our family for other reasons. So when she tries to present that point of view, because if you need accommodations and modifications in a university setting or K-12, we're talking about those issues and they, they don't really want to be labeled that way. So that's a whole other yeah. conversation, but I just think it's important to see that, that some of these issues really have far-reaching effect on our undergraduate students. You know, we can promote diversity, but if it's not really diversity, if it's not rich, if we're not appreciating multiple points of view, opening up all sides of the conversation really, then it, it's just diversity for diversity's sake, which is is not at all helpful or relevant. Sure. And I love your example of a biology professor who doesn't believe in the theory of evolution. That just <laughs> might not be helpful. Thank you. Um, let me just respond to the issue of a biology professor and then ask a question. I regard the presence of an of a evolutionary uh, denying biology professor as an opportunity to see how uh, people would respond to a fundamental challenge to their points of view. And therefore, I see it as not a, a total loss by any means. And I think that the problem, one of the problems we have is that, that uh, establishments of all sorts are very reluctant to uh, deal with fundamental challenges to their point of view. And I, so therefore, I say it's not without value of having such a professor. Uh, now, the, but the question I wanted to ask the panel was if they would each say a few words about their concept of the proper role of the university in society. And that, uh, I wonder if they could just, uh, in general, reflect upon that uh, question. Uh, let me jump in and say, I, I think, and have always felt, that the university should be a place where you get a chance to experience a wide range of, the whole range, if you will, of uh, forms of knowledge, uh, forms of opinions, uh, philosophies, ideologies, and so forth. That's our job, actually, is to present that to students, whether they like it or not. 
Um, and one of the reasons I retired was because I got really tired of the students who told me the books were too old that I was right. having them okay. read. I was having them read Durkheim, Weber, and Marx because I was a classical <laughs> sociological theory. That class is not taught at CU anymore. No kidding. Uh, isn't that an outrage? Isn't that terrible? Oh my God. By the way, the books I teach are 2,000 years old, so. <laughs> Okay, no, that, that, is, that is terrible. Tom, I really appreciate your question, yeah, and we could talk all day. Unfortunately, as I get older, I remind myself more and more of my father. So I'm going to have to say, we're going to have to cut off this nonsense right now and move on to the next panel. Well, some of us have to go put money in the parking yeah. Plus there's... So I'll tell you, let's take a five-minute break and start on the next panel.